All right, I'm going to get started. Hi, everyone. Welcome to the last live session of today. John Armstrong from Jump Code. Great. Uh, so thanks, thanks, Liz. Thanks to Pack Bio uh, for having me today. Um, again, my name is John Armstrong. I'm the VP of R&D at Jump Code Genomics, and I'm going to talk today about um, give you some insight into how we take our technology at Jump Code and uh, combine that with the Pack Bio IsoSeq system and single cell. Uh, to uh, increase sensitivity of isoform detection. So first, there you go. You know, when we think about sequencing, whether it be, you know, short read or long read sequencing, we have a little bit of a needle in the haystack problem. And it's, and it's really only getting worse. Um, essentially, we're generating enormous amounts of sequencing data, uh, but the um, and but the vast majority of that sequencing data is uninformative for the questions that we're often asking. And so, if we were able to, um, in some way, refine libraries prior to putting them on a sequencing machine, we could then um, preserve uh, real estate on a on a flow cell or a sequencing device for informative molecules. And this is exactly what we do at Jump Code. We leverage uh, the CRISPR Cas9 system, and um, uniquely designed guides to be able to go in and remove uninformative molecules or fragments from sequencing libraries prior to them going on a sequencer. Uh, it's an extremely easy workflow. Um, in, in most cases, it's, it's just an hour uh, incubation with the library, and um, you can cut up those fragments um, and without um, adapters on the ends of those fragments or other moieties on the ends of those fragments, then they don't end up um, amplifying in the PCR reaction and, and, and go away in the cleanup. As I mentioned, the importance of this is that we're retaining real estate on a flow cell um, to then um, remove things, as I mentioned in, my, in, the, uh, in the title of my talk, things like actin B, uh, coding mitochondrial, coding ribosomal transcripts. These are chewing up thousands and thousands, if not millions of reads in many sequencing experiments. And the outcome of this is that, as we know, Liz had talked about earlier it was short read sequencing where we there's multiple problems with isoform detection and short read sequencing. Um, one of those major ones is you just don't have long reads long enough to cross over multiple exon exon boundaries and recapitulate isoforms. But with long read sequencing, you have that ability. Um, however, the same thing occurs here with whether it be short read or long read is that you're um, generating an enormous amount of non informative or uninformative sequencing data. So at jump code one of our thoughts was in in you know in 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 thinking about you know how our clients apply the pack bio instrument um, within single cell isoseq and also with some of our current studies as well with collaborators how we could kind of marry our two technologies together and the first thing that we needed to do was identify the things that we wanted to remove and one of the easiest ways to do that is to simply take pack bio sequencing i'm sorry take uh short read sequencing data from the 10X platform um, across multiple tissue types, and then go in and simply look at um, what reads uh, through the an analytical component are, are being removed because they're, they're uninformative. And, and so this is a relatively simple graphic of this, where if you look at a normal, uh, if you look at a normal 10X um, uh, output onto a sequencer, um, sp this is specifically short read here, that about, you know, you produce a million reads, for example, uh, about 200,000 of those reads are actually informative. Uh, the rest of that data is um, either transcriptomic, where it's ribo and mito coding, um, or non-variable genes that are not used in, um, in Surat for, for cell discrimination. You also have a little bit of ribosomal RNA, but also there's, there's a, a significant percentage of, of reads that align to the only the genome that do not align to the transcriptome. And this could be some stochastic priming from poly A, poly, you know, poly or oligo DT primers, things like that. But uh, either way, we end up with 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 enormous amounts of data coming off a 10x machine um, that is uh, spurious to the questions that that people are asking. And so our goal at, at Jump Code was: can we design guides um, to use in our CRISPR-Cas9 system that target these fragments in the libraries and therefore take Remove those fragments prior to sequencing, and then um, have more informative fragments go onto the onto the sequencer. And this, what we call read reassignment, where we can reassign reads from 
uh, non-informative areas to informative to informative areas. And so, you know, the current setup for um, our our single cell boost kit at Jump Code, it we're targeting genomic intervals, as I mentioned, things that you would only see if you align to the human genome. You won't see them if you align to the transcriptome. Uh, we're looking at um, we're also looking to deplete uh, ribosomal RNA, uh, non-polyadenylated, as well as the um, ribosomal genes, uh, polyadenylated mitochondrial genes, and then, as I mentioned, these non-variable genes that um, we've identified across all of these tissue types that really don't play a role in cell discrimination. And you can see here, as we, uh, early on in our work, when we were simply doing a lot of in silico work to understand what percentages these make up in short read data, you can see that um, ribosome RNA is about 10%. Then as we move to uh, ribomyto, that's 33. And then we have this additive system that is you continually add these things that, um, that get filtered out uh, through the software um, that we can ultimately get up to somewhere around 50%, 60% read reassignment with short read data. So our, you know, one of our thoughts was, can we take this and, and simply apply it um, to the, um, to the PAC bio isoseq system for increased isoform detection. And um, certainly we knew that there may be um, um, targets that, that didn't apply in our, in, you know, with our, our system, but that's okay, because really it's the 10X platform that's generating, um, the, generating uh, those fragments that ultimately go into a library. And so, I'm going to show you a study overview here that we performed on PBMC samples. Um, this also, part of this has just been recently um, submitted for publication. And unfortunately, I didn't list the paper here, but I, if anyone's interested, I can follow up with that after. But we essentially took donor PBMCs, extracted RNA, put it through the 10X system, and then with this, performed depletion with a guide set targeting coding ribosomal and mitochondrial transcripts. Um, our single cell boost kit, which includes those and other things, and I'll show that in a minute. And then we, we combined a single cell boost kit with Panglao 800, and I'll describe what that means here in a second. Um, very simple, as I mentioned, hour-long incubation, goes in, cuts up library fragments, uh, and then um, those library fragments go away in subsequent steps. And then you end up with a refined library that can go on a PacBio pack bio sequencer. And I'll show data analysis for percent read alignments, depletion rates for each of these um, each of these modules. I'll show total isoforms and novel isoforms as well for PBMCs. So a little bit on the guide sets here and the guide design. As I mentioned, the guide design that in one module we have is for ribomyto, and this is coding ribosomal mitochondrial. It's about 100 genes that we've we've chosen. The single cell boost kit that we currently have as a product, we also tested in this system where we're designing to unaligned reads, ribosomal mitochondrial, so that's the ribomyto, and the non-variable genes that don't play a role in, um, in, in cell discrimination. And then Panglao 800, it's a database uh, compendium of many, 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 many single cell experiments done in a cell in a well, um, 10X, uh, other types of single cell um, um, platforms. And what they've done essentially is gone through and looked at uh, the genes that are identified across the cell types in, in all of those experiments. And then they assign a ubiquity index to that, the, essentially the percentage of cells that these genes show up in. And, and we simply chose the first 800 of top 800 of those genes to, to combine with this. You can see in the Venn diagram below here how the overlap of these gene sets work. And you can see that the ribomyto is contained in both Panglao and single cell boost. Um, but there is some uniqueness to the Panglao and single cell boost. And our goal was to see as we add in Panglao, are we going to gain any more information with that, um, with uh, adding in additional guides for those, those genes. And so first, when we look at the reads aligning to targeted regions, so these are regions that we are targeting with the CRISPR-Cas9 system for removal. Um, on the left in the purple bar, you can see the um, controls where we're not performing depletion. This is just simply running it through a normal system for isoseq. Um, on the y-axis is the percentage of aligned reads. And then we're aligning here to the genome because we also want to be, since we have guides targeting genomic intervals, uh, we, we want to be able to look at the reads across the whole genome. You can see here that um, with all of the modules, we're, we're, we're getting rid of, rid of nearly all of the, all of the reads that are emanating from those regions. 
um, you can see with the with the Panglo 800 and the single cell boost um, that the depletion percentage takes we're around two percent, two and a half percent instead of you know less than one percent. Uh, but remember also, and this will be a little bit of a resounding theme with the Pangolo 800 set, even though they're ubiquitous, doesn't mean that they're highly expressed. So ribomyto, highly expressed. NVGs, many of them are highly expressed. But with the Pangolo 800, just because they're ubiquitous doesn't mean they're highly expressed. And so we don't have as high of efficiency of cutting of those. And then when we look at depletion rates, when we simply say um, the percentage of of percentage of 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 um, coverage for control minus depleted divided by control you can see here that we have greater than um, 90 percent depletion rate for all of the modules and um and again this is looking really good so what what's the really what's the what do we see from the outcome of this and here i think i would like visuals a lot just to say is the system really working and so simply when we take and put um these these reads into IGV for these two genes. Um, we have, um, uh, I believe this is actually the TXNIB gene, not NIP. No, it is TXNIP. Um, so this is um, a gene involved in, in oxidative stress, cellular oxidative stress. You can see that the coverage with in the control um, is for is 4,400 um, X coverage. And then when we when we look at the depleted sample, it goes down to 61. Actin B. I had to include that, of course, because it's in the title of my talk, but we have 53,000 X coverage um, in, within the control sample, and then it goes down to 389 with depleted. And so um, this is just two examples of, of what that outcome is. In, 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 and also one thing I'll mention here is that, yes, we're removing these, these reads essentially from these areas, but the important point is, is that you now have, at least in Actin B, you have 53,000 reads that are going to other things. And they're going there in a, and um, we've looked at this, it, they're not going in a chunky way. They're going in, in, a, in a very flat way across, across, they essentially get reassigned across everything that's left there. And so um, this can be really powerful as you go in and start removing these library fragments and reassigning reads. And in fact, when we look at the total isoforms um, generated by the different guide modules, and we look at those, um, we look at those in the context of PBMCs where we're looking at total isoforms on the y-axis, but where requirement here is that we want to see greater than two full-length reads um, so that we're removing some of the noise. You can see that with the single cell boost, the best performing um, guide module, which is, as I mentioned, is our current uh, kit that we sell, um, we're seeing a 375% increase in um, total isoforms. The other important, po important point to mention here that I, 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 I did speak to on the previous slide is that you can see that the ratio of isoforms in the control of the different isoform species is not changing. It's actually just increasing in a, um, in a, in a, in a, in a grand way across all of those species. And so we're, you know, this is that read reassignment that happens, um, happens in a, in a non-variable way across all of the things that are left there. And that's an important point um, that the methodology is actually retaining, um, retaining these ratios. And then when we look at novel isoforms, you can see um, we have the same, same type of thing happening in, 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 in ratios um, of the species increasing from control to depleted, which is on the right. Um, again, this is, us, this is um, on the y-axis, this, this is novel isoforms, but we're filtering for two, two or greater full length here. And, um, and you can see the single cell boost is performing the best here. Um, uh, we have some ideas why we see a decrease in, in when we add in the Panglao 800, um, and and I think that they're, um, it's not significant enough here to be of concern, but it, it's just really not adding anything, and I think it's largely because of the overlap, the large overlap, overlap between the sets. Then one thing that we were really interested in taking a look at is understanding, okay, so we, you know, we're looking at isoforms in the previous slides, and that was part of this analysis, but we also want to see, are we just generally increasing the complexity of the library? And so what we've done here is we've, we've, we've taken and said, um, we've binned out reads in, in 10,000 read bins, deduplicated reads here, and then we want to count the unique genes that we find in each of those 10,000 read bins. And, and we did this, you know, over, um, you know, over uh, 
over up, up to a million reads um, plus. And so you can see here that we have a couple things going on. One is because we're removing those transcripts from the highly expressed um, non-informative information, and we're we're now uh, reassigning those reads to to other to other genes. You can see that we're increasing the complexity of the library, and we're doing this in a, to almost twofold. So the complexity of the genes that we find. The other important point here is not only are we increasing the, the 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 number of genes that are found, we're also increasing the number of unique reads. Um, so you can see here in the control, we didn't do any filtering or anything. We just let it go. In the control, the number of deduplicated reads or unique molecules is around 160,000. Yet we're finding it go up um, and slightly continuing to slightly increase even over a million here. And so we're, we're getting recognizing somewhere around a eightfold or, or so increase here, almost a tenfold increase in the number of unique molecules in the library. And then when we do the same thing with isoforms and look at the same type of analysis, you can see that we have uh, 4.75, which is a 375% increase in isoforms um, within in the depleted versus the control. And concomitantly, a, a 7.23 fold increase in unique molecules for those isoforms. So, so, so definitely there is some, um, you know, there is some power here to the, to the jump code methodology and, and, and ultimately raising sensitivity of gene detection and isoform detection. And so in, in summary today, um, we, in this, in the case of single cell boost, we have 32,000 CRISPR guides targeting around a thousand genes or intervals. When we look at the Panglo 800 set with that, um, with the single cell set, as I've shown on some of the slides, it's actually up to a, around over 100,000 guides that we're doing in there um, and, and targeting 1,600 genes, 1,700 genes and in intervals. The reads um, originating, as I've shown, from the target genes are depleted greater than 90% in all the guide modules. And this depletion ultimately results in higher numbers of isoforms and genes with all three of these guide modules. Um, of interest to us in the PBMCs and it was... The, that the novel not in catalog isoforms increase significantly with the CRISPR clean depletion. And we see further increases in isoform discovery when we um, think about things in terms or design guides for tissue specific um, panels. So let's say there's a person that's a liver researcher and, and specifically wants to look at um, isoforms in liver. We have the ability because the CRISPR Cas9 system is so programmable, we can do custom sets for researchers um, to be able to look to use specifically within their research. And, uh, you know, for example, they want to be removing albumin all the time. Um, and, and, and that's something we can absolutely do. And so I'll close there with a thanks for um, the PAC Bio crew and for Liz. Thanks to the team at Jump Code that did this work. And, um, and if you have any interest in the single cell boost kit that we have and you want to use it within the, the PAC Bio IsoSeq system, um, please, you can either shoot me an email or you can find us at uh, jumpcodegenomics.com. Genomics, cool. So I'm oh. going to keep your icon on for now. Okay. Because I think for, yeah, okay, it's on. So for your questions, we're just going to use this. Okay, so great. Switch over Easy enough. Things. Easy yeah. enough. Yeah. So question is, have you worked with single cell, single nucleotanix libraries? Because one of the uh, curious points they pointed out was that maybe the issues with pre-mRNA, pre -RNA, aka not completely spliced mRNAs, are abundant in single nuclei preps, and like they're interested in that the removal of pre-mRNA is something that you guys want to target for mm -hmm. people. We have we have not done that, but it is it is very quickly coming down the line for us in R and D. We have some collaborators that have uh, single nuclei. Um, cDNA splits already from 10x that are ready to go. And we'll probably be testing that in the next, I'd say, four to six weeks. Okay. And then the other question about the Panglao 800. Mm -hmm. um, they're wondering if with, with Panglao 800, you are losing some new isoforms from those ubiquitous, ubiquitously expressed genes. Right. Yes. Yeah. And so, um, so that yeah, so the 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 data that I showed for that was a little bit in the in the D or de uh, development side, in the sense of, okay, if we if we take this other guide set that we've used for other things and we put it in together with the single cell boost, is just simply adding more guides and removing more fragments helping us find more things. What I think is happening there is because we designed those guide sets individually, and it didn't they didn't go through our, 
we didn't put all of those genes through our guide design pipeline together. What we have potentially is we have guides that are sitting down very close to each other. Um, you know, we have these, these RMPs sitting down very close to each other, and there could potentially be some inhibition of cutting. And so um, I think that's why we see a slight decrease there. Um, and, and yes, we're, we're likely using, losing isoforms from those. Um, but I think ultimately the single cell boost is the, is the product that we have right now. And that one we've designed very specifically um, so that we are not removing things that people may be interested in. And really the Panglao 800 and the data I showed was more on the development side. Mm -hmm. um, next follow-up question. Have you compared your depletion modules to probe enriched approaches in regards to identifying low abundance genes? We have not done that. We have some collaborators that are definitely interested in doing that. Um, I came from a background of targeted capture, um, and I do know if the there you know the protocols there. I think in some ways, and I'll just comment on on some of the we don't have any data for it, but I'll comment is a little more onerous there than than in our incubation, um, and the. The other thing is, I think this is a really important point for our technology, is that we're essentially taking and flipping the script on targeted capture. Targeted capture, you need to know what to find, what you want to find. For us, you just need to know what you don't want to have there. And thus, your, our, our methodology allows a researcher to approach their work in a hypothesis-neutral manner, whereas targeted capture is not hypothesis-neutral. You need to know what you're looking for. And so there is... Um, for, for certain people, there is real power in, in being able to go in hypothesis neutral and completely open the iris on your discovery space. So we don't have any data on it, but that's the main comment that I'll make is that's the main two differences between, between our technologies. One more question. Will Jumpco be interested in removing RNAs or resistant linear RNAs to help enrich circular RNAs? So RNAs resistant RNAs. Yes. So basically, ah, I see. I see. Yeah, yeah. RNAs yeah. To, to get the circular RNAs. So I'm well versed in circular RNAs. So this is a good one. I used to work in this as well. Um, uh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, that's what is great about the programmability of of the system. And we do custom work with people. Is that is that if if you know that that if you know the the sequence or the ensemble gene name or uh, of those things you want to remove, we can absolutely design guides to those. And what we can do is, um, you know, we, we also have a, a, a do not target list. So obviously we would want to have the sequence of circular, known circular RNAs in that do not target list as well. Awesome. Okay, Antonio, if you can come on, come on stage. Hi, uh, good morning, everyone. I'm Antonio, a, a postdoctoral scientist at Brunner Lab at Cedar Sinai in Los Angeles. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank to PacBio for inviting me to this ISO 6 Social Club Volume 3. What I'm going to talk about today is how we could uncover the roots of tumor heterogeneity when a standard single cell resolution is not enough. Uh, yeah, particularly, I'm going to talk about uh, mother technology that is our approach to get a somatic transgenic model and why they are a great uh, model for preclinical testing platform. Um, tipping into the limitation of the standard cell rate and how uh, long resequencing single cell could help us to deconvolute high grade glioma. Well, mother technology is based on a mosaic analysis by dual recombinase mediated cassette chain that permit uh, stable labeling of mutant cell, which are expressing the transgenic element from a specific chromosomal loci. <clears throat> to do that, we do a double recombination with Cree and Flipase, which add together to introduce a group of genes inside our model in an efficient and easy way. To introduce the DNA into the brain cell, we use electroporation, a really simple technique. We directly inject the DNA into the left hemisphere of a brain of a one day postnatal mouse, and then we take a brain electrode to sub the DNA into the dividing precursor cells. Uh, this uh, technique is a very hydro method, method because uh, we can do several hundred uh, 
pups in the morning with a huge control about the orientation and the magnitude of our uh, mother transgenesis. This uh, methodology, the mother technique, uh, permits uh, generate uh, several mouse models uh, with a bunch of applications. Being one of our main applications, the modeling of pediatric brain tumor that are carrying the most common mutations. So taking the Dr. Javadu paper as a jumping off point in our study, we model two patients that have a PDFRA activate mutation and TP53 dominant negative uh, mutation, but they differ in the histone 3.3 mutation. One half K27N and the other G34R mutation that are common mutation in pediatric brain tumors. Uh, the histone 3.3 protein mutation are really fascinating in the sense that they have the same clinical um, presentation and have similar function, but the phenotype is uh, a quite different since the K27M mutated tumor are presented in the midline and the spinal cord with short uh, overall rate and the G34R mutated tumor are usually cortical with better survival rate than the K27M. So to, do, uh, to generate these models, we inject the DNA into the brain and then importantly, sweep the uh, electrode path from the medial to the dorsal region in the brain to target of the, uh, the cells from the midline and the dorsal. So we are targeting the precursor uh, cells that are going to lead the formation of tumor in both regions. So we are uh, giving the chance to uh, our model to generate tumor in both areas. Well, after 120 days, our models show the same phenotype that I just explained. The k 27 n tumor show an infiltration in the striatum and in the corpus callosum but the cell don't invade the cortex. In contrast, the G34R tumor have a huge infiltration in the cortex, but not in the striatum. In our model, we did not get any exception of this phenotype, since all the G34R tumor were located in the quarter, cortex, and all the K27M were uh, located in the striatum. Also, the G34R tumor show a better overall survival that the K27M. Uh, this, is, uh, this was so fascinating to us because only the chain of uh, one uh, amino acid in the histone 3.3 are dictating the location where the tumor is forming. And even given the PDFRA and TP53 mutations. So to explore uh, the heterogeneity of this uh, tumor and the accuracy of mother as, a, as an accurate uh, model, we do single cell to compare our data with Mario Suva Mariola human uh, data set. Making a long story short, we found that the, in the K27N tumor, we found uh, the same population that was previously described in the human data set by Mario Suvo and Mariola, even in the same uh, proportion. So our model, uh, our model is so close to human, even at single cell. So given the accuracy of uh, our model system to generate autochthonous tumor models, reflecting the clinical subtype of flyoma, and knowing the potential of single cell to study heterogeneity, we decide to uh, make a huge uh, single cell mouse um, the, uh, atlas that uh, start with integration with uh, developing brain and normal brain data set from Linearson lab. Also to this data, we add uh, different uh, tumor data set from our models to improve our knowledge about the heterogeneity between them and also to discover different transcriptomic programs. Thanks to this outlet, we found different cellular lineage and differentiation routes. As we can see here, the oligodendrocyte differentiation route 
and the microglia and endothelial cluster of cells. Also, uh, this uh, atlas allows us to uh, explore the heterogeneity between similar tumors. As, uh, as we can see here, these are, uh, are two ependymomas that only are different in a gene fusion. So both have a different distribution in our UMAP embedding in our atlas. However, this atlas was uh, not uh, was unable <clears throat> to differentiate between some pediatric tumors, such as those that have an alteration in the histone 3.3. This, this uh, fact uh, were so interesting because uh, was the were the only tumor that uh, were overlapping in our atlas. Even other pediatric tumor with a different mutation don't overlap with this tumor. Furthermore, these tumors are so heterogeneous in other aspects, like uh, histone mark, as you can see here in this PCA, the G34R and K27N sample are different distributed through uh, this plot. Moreover, when we take a look at chromosomic level and uh, after analysis of copy number variation, we found that the G34R have a variable and complex pattern of an diploidea and clonality than the K27N. And those more, are more complex too than the wild, than the wild type. Same results uh, were found when we uh, look at the DNA methylation landscape, where we can see that they saw are totally, that the tumors are totally different. Then if they uh, show heterogeneity at DNA methylation level and copy number variation, why did not find this heterogeneity in our outlet at a single cell level? The answer to this question could be behind of the limitation of the short read single cell sequencing. Because we cannot uh, explore the splicing um, with this uh, methodology. And as the, the splicing process have a relevant role in the, uh, in the um, progression of the brain tumors. So taking new approaches, uh, such as a new approach in single cell, such as the long read sequencing developed by PacBio, uh, uh, we can explore this uh, splicing alteration uh, to the convoluted heterogeneity of our glioma cells, which is a huge relevant um, limitation of a standard droplet-based single cell uh, sequencing. So taking advantage of uh, this new uh, methodology, we made sure by long risk sequencing uh, different, uh, uh, different tumor models related with the histone 3.3 mutation. Wild type, uh, wild type uh, model, a Q27 mutated model, and the G34 mutated model in comparison with a control uh, samples that are from embryonic brain. Then after get the tumor, we establish uh, the organoids and we measure, as I said, uh, the cell by long risk sequencing and analyzing the data with the ISOC3 application. Furthermore, uh, we use the ISO3 uh, ISO application together with the Talon software, Talon software that allow us to uh, accurate and correctly annotate the different transcripts across all our sample. Interestingly, uh, we did not find any, uh, any differences between the, uh, the number of transcripts categorized uh, by Talon in each sample. However, when we analyze the, uh, the data and we correct uh, the batch of this sample, we found that the uh, tumor sample were together in this UMAP and really got differentiated from the control sample. This uh, fact was more evident when we take a look of top to a expression that is a proliferative marker of uh, cycling cells, where we can see that are more expressed um, in the tumor sample that in the control condition. So making, uh, uh, taking all our effort 
to explore the heterogeneity between samples, we reanalyze the data, removing the control condition. And we, uh, after reanalyzing the data in the new U map, we can see that the uh, distribution of the soil in this plot were different and not too much overlapping. So although we need uh, more analysis and deeping more in the uh, splicing, uh, we, uh, we could find some tumor markers that are, um, that are the convoluting the heterogeneity of this tumor that was not possible with the short uh, read single cell. Also, this is giving the importance to the analysis of the splicing to explore the heterogeneity of the tumor that at the beginning looked like so similar. This importance is also super when we take a look of uh, the huge count of, uh, of, the, of the sample, the, uh, the total count of the transcript of the sample, where we can see that the unique transcript in each sample are higher than the um, uh, number of transcripts that are shared between them, except k 27 n All in all, to conclude, uh, we can say that the short read is the tip of the iceberg of tumor heterogeneity that could be solved by uh, new long read sequencing with PathBio that also is compatible with the short read process. Finally, I would like to thank to Elizabeth Sen, uh, Roger Bolden, and Alex Westman for the, um, for the help to set up this analysis and this technology in our lab, and also to all of uh, lab members, collaborators, and fundings to make this, uh, this kind of project possible. And you all for your attention. Thank you. Thank you, Antonio. So um, I have a question first, and I know we've discussed this a little bit on Slack as well, is kind of like, what, what is the next step of analysis that you need to kind of you know, like what's what's still missing? I know we we were talking about how to integrate these samples and do like a sample to sample analysis. Like, what's still missing, and what would you like to see? Uh, it's a great question, and and this also tap I got a lot of ideas uh, how how we can continue with the analysis. So uh, the next uh, step in this analysis, we could um, um, analyze the different splicing between the sample and also found if one of important genes of all the, mar all the markers are different splice between the samples and condition. And then if we found different, uh, different splicing between sample, we could dip into the differential splicing between the cluster of this, uh, of this sample. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and also I know for this pilot study, um, I think we sequenced one sample for each of the types, I believe. No, it was right. two samples. Two it samples two sample. for each one. Yeah. I guess what I wanted to ask is how how different do you expect those those replicates to be, and would you need would you need to see more of it? Yeah, because uh, to make uh, our result more robust, we thought that we need to uh, include more sample between the between the condition. Could be uh, we could obtain two results that maybe uh, get the overlapping again, like the short read, or maybe uh, get uh, get more differences between the conditions between the type of tumors. So yeah, absolutely, we need. To, I think that we need to to get more more samples. Cool. Thank you. Thank you. All right, so I'm gonna bring up next is Katie's talk. All right. Okay. Can you hear me, Liz? Yes, I can. Okay. Awesome. Okay. Yeah. Thanks for having me. Uh, I'm a research professor here at Nationwide Children's Hospital in Columbus, Ohio, um, which is also affiliated with the Ohio State University. Uh, let me turn on my pointer. Okay. All right, so um, today I want to talk about a study that we're doing, um, and we're studying somatic mosaicism 
Um, so most people might be familiar with this term um, as it is used to talk about tumors. So somatic mosaicism is somewhere along the way, a cell develops a mutation. Um, that mutation probably confers a selective advantage to that cell, and then all of the daughter cells have it, and then you have mosaicism, right? So sometimes this can lead to disease, as I mentioned in um, tumors. Um, what we study is somatic mosaicism and neurological disorders. So there are a couple um, phenotypes or diseases that I want to just introduce as terms. Maybe um, some people are familiar with these, but um, in particular, there's things called focal cortical dysplasia or FCD. And these are actually um, diagnoses that are made based on pathology review. Um, but due to advances in sequencing and molecular profiling, we know that um, some of these different types of FCDs have um, characteristic gene mutations in the tissue. So for example, in FCD1, we often see these mutations in a gene called SLC35A2. Um, in FCD2, um, it's mTOR pathway mutations, so anything in that pathway can be affected. Um, and then there's a type called FCD3, which I just wanted to point out um, just to introduce this term, which is called LEAT. So these are long-term epilepsy-associated tumors. So um, type 3 FCDs are anything associated with lesions. So this could be like sclerosis. Mostly it's tumors um, that just happens um, likely causal for the patient's epilepsy, but they're always associated with some sort of lesion. Um, we're particularly interested in the ones that are not associated with lesions because, as you can imagine, when you sequence a tumor, you're going to find mutations. Um, but we're interested in studying more like these FCD1 and 2s where we don't, going into it, we don't know the mutation. Um, so here at Nationwide Children's Hospital, we're um, uniquely poised that we can study these patients um, because a lot of them not all of them, a lot of them undergo surgery to remove the affected brain tissue. So when these kids don't respond to typical medical management, like with um, drugs, prescription drugs that would treat their epilepsy, they can actually undergo surgery to remove the affected portion of the brain. And we have um, a research study where we can get some of that brain tissue and study it um, on a molecular basis. So um, to date, we have 74 patients enrolled in the study, and we've characterized um, all of the brain tissues from these patients. Um, we recently published the first 50 cases. Um, the publication um, citation is down here if you're interested in reading it. So from the first 50 cases, we published our findings. Um, and so here in um, just this panel A figure I'm showing, what we're routinely doing is getting the resected brain, doing high depth exome sequencing, and then using the patient's blood as a comparator, right? So similar to you would do with tumor normal exome sequencing. So we're trying to identify mutations that are restricted to the brain, not in the patient's blood, so not a germline mutation. And then we're just following that up um, with amplicon targeted sequencing because a lot of these mutations are very low frequency. So um, maybe less than five or 10% allele frequency, which can kind of be at the noise level of exome. So we're just using a targeted sequencing approach once we know the mutations, if there are any that we can follow up on. Um, so panels B and C are just kind of showing the, the results from our first 50 cases. So um, this bar plot here is showing for the different FCD types, um, the percentage of cases where we found a causal like damaging mutation in the sample. Um, so the gray indicates that we didn't find a mutation, uh, at least that could explain their disease. Um, and then the dark color versus light color indicates somatic versus germline. So, for example, for this light blue, we did find patients who usually knew about it ahead of time because they have family history or something, but they did have germline mutations in the cases. Um, <clears throat> and then, of course, for the leads, as I mentioned, because these are tumors, we always find causal mutations. Um, but as I also mentioned, we are interested in these FCD ones and twos where they had somatic mutations in known genes, like these are known to be associated with epilepsy. Um, but we wanted to study those more. Uh, and so then panel E, I'm just showing, um, actually for most cases, we have multiple brain tissues um, from these patients. So sometimes we get different regions, we might get just different portions of the brain from the surgical resection. Um, and what, what I'm showing here is like, if we identified a mutation, it's just showing the range of the allele frequency for that mutation. So as I mentioned, sometimes it's pretty low, less than 5%, but it can vary. Um, based on the tissue that we're profiling. Okay, so I'm going to share um, two cases today about um, just, you know, after we did the exome sequencing, we wanted to further characterize these. We have 
frozen tissue available to us um, for these patients. So we're doing a lot of RNA-seq, we're doing a lot of single nuclei RNA sequencing, um, just to further characterize the variant, how it's affecting expression, et cetera. Um, so the first patient I want to talk about had a, actually two variants, which was um, pretty surprising to us, but two pathogenic somatic variants in the gene called P10. Um, this is a well-known tumor suppressor gene, but this patient did not have a tumor. They just had epilepsy. Um, and we, again, published these results if you um, are curious to read it. Um, so we identified two variants, but due to the limitations of short read sequencing, um, we were unable to phase those variants, right? So our first question, <clears throat> which we addressed using ISIS-seq, was uh, are the variants on the same allele or are they in cis or trans? Um, so we actually used a targeted ISIS-seq approach. So we have um, a hybridization capture panel of 16 epilepsy genes. Basically, it's a summary of all the mutations that we've um, identified in these cases. We just have probes that cover all of those genes. So for us, it's 16 right now. Um, and we're using this just to enrich for those transcripts of interest, just to increase, you know, just as John talked about, <laughs> instead of using a depletion method of what we don't want, we're capturing the transcripts we do want, right? Because we're looking for these variants. Um, so in this panel E, this is just from bulk tissue RNA-seq, but you can appreciate. So we had like 10 or more different tissues for this case, right? And so you can see that some of them had both variants of P10, but some of them only had this exon 5 variant. So when we did our targeted ISOSeq approach, we um, recovered 21 full-length reads, um, but none of them, as indicated by this purple bar, had both variants, right? So these variants are not on the same allele. Now, what we wanted to do next, because we have frozen tissue, we do single nuclei RNA sequencing, right? Um, but we wanted to do long read sequencing in addition to the standard workflow of short reads so that we can overlay the genotype with the gene expression. So we're using the 10X Genomics um, 3' prime gene expression kit. And this, this top part, right, is just kind of showing the workflow that, that you would do. You would create cDNA, fragment it, generate libraries that are compatible with Illumina platform, and then get your gene expression values. Um, <clears throat> but as Liz mentioned and so beautifully introduced, you're very limited by this um, workflow from 10X Genomics because you're only getting reads at the three prime end of every transcript. And these P10 variants are in the middle of the transcript as are most variants that we're interested in. Um, <clears throat> so where we split this bottom part, we took the residual cDNA that was not used for 10X uh, and then did PacBio isoseq sequencing to genotype. And then because this 10X cDNA already has the barcode from the 10X workflow, we can then overlay the genotype of the P10 variants with the gene expression. Uh, and so we wanted to understand, <clears throat> I think initially two things. One is, do we see any cells that are affected by both P10 mutations? And the other one is to understand what cell types these P10 variants are in, um, because that can tell us a lot actually about <clears throat> the biology of the disease or um, you know, where these mutations may have occurred in development, et cetera. So here is our um, results from that. So um, this is just a Tisney plot of the cells that we sequenced from this patient with P10. So again, this is from brain tissue, as you can see. Um, this top plot here is showing um, overlay with the genotype, right? So the light gray, which is the majority of cells, um, is a no call. The dark gray means that it matched to the reference um, the blue indicates that that cell has the exon 5 variant in P10, and the orange is exon 9. And we did identify a few cells that had both variants, but I'm not convinced that it's not an artifact or something. So um, I wasn't going to focus on that for this talk. But you can appreciate in the bar plot down here that the it seems that the oligodendrocytes and astrocytes are enriched for um, the variant. So we, so for all the patients now that we've identified somatic mutations, we are interested in um, doing this type of characterization to genotype the single cells. And as I said, answer a lot of questions, you know, how is the mutation affecting gene expression? What cell type is it in, et cetera. Um, so we have a nice cohort now of 24 unique tissues where we've sequenced almost 100,000 total single cells. Um, and we are actively working to um, we already have the short read data produced, um, and we're actively working to produce this um, using PacBio long read sequencing to understand the genotype. 
Okay, so I'll show you one more case. So we had um, a patient with a, a pathogenic variant in Reb. Um, and what we know from other studies and papers, this is a presumably activating mutation. Um, and you can see here we had four tissues from this patient's brain, the surgical resection. Um, and you, just showing here, like you can appreciate the different frequencies that it was found in these different tissues. Um, and again, this Reb is like a known um, causal gene for epilepsy. So I want to first show you the single cell data um, from this, and then I'll show you that we coupled it with the isoseq, but actually we coupled it with the mouse isoseq um, just to increase the yield and throughput. But this mutation in particular was actually near the five prime end of the gene. Um, <clears throat> so the if you're familiar with 10x chromium kits, they have a five prime and a three prime kit, and so we actually used both on this case um, because we thought, you know, because the location of the variant, obviously we're gonna get better genotyping with the five prime kit. So you can see the five prime kit on the right, <clears throat> you can see, you know, just visually appreciate that the mutations that were called were at a much greater yield um, than the three prime kit, which was like very, very sparse. Um, and just for, for your knowledge, we're using this um, package called Vartrix from 10X Genomics to genotype these cells. So you can basically just give you know, give it a BCF um, if you have that from XM sequencing and it will genotype those calls in your single cell data. Um, so we actually did this with quite a few cases and it's um, just a little manuscript um, under peer review right now because we we're interested in comparing the five and three prime kit. Um, but we're still left with a lot of unknowns, right? Like more than 50% of our cells still were not genotyped. So um, <laughs> one of my colleagues, Anthony Miller, actually identified this paper on um, a preprint on BioArchive, and um, Liz introduced it, so I don't want to um, <clears throat> go over it too much in detail, Just, um, but it's just basically, it's, it's actually a really simple method when you think about it, but um, it's just concatenating these molecules together, and then each molecule already is from the 10x prep, right? So it's like its own little 10x library in each of these concatenated molecules, um, and we're doing this because we know that the average length of our 10x cDNA from the single nuclei that we've been doing is around 1.5 kb, right? So we're actually losing a lot of information with each pack bio read, um, or losing out on potential of information because we're reading a 1.5 kb molecule probably more times than we need. So um, when we found this paper, we thought it'd be cool because we can actually, you know, concatenate together 15 molecules. So for each circular read, we're now getting 15 molecules, right? And because we know the schematic of this library, <clears throat> we can then like deconcatenate it, you know, based on these primers that we've already used, but then also understand what transcript came from what cell because it already has the 10x barcode. Um, so we're, we, we've done this protocol in our hands and we've made a couple modifications that I just want to point out. One is that, um, as I mentioned before, for our other case, we're enriching for these genes. So this is kind of like our... Um, <laughs> epilepsy panel as it stands now, just so we can plug and play with different cases. Um, this is comprehensive of all the genes that we've um, discovered as causal for these patients. Um, and then the other step we've added is before we actually load onto the sequencer, we're doing a size selection just to remove the smaller molecules um, in case this, you know, in case this ligation wasn't efficient or something like that. So we really want to increase our chances that we're sequencing those long molecules and that we're sequencing the ones we care about, which is why we're using the panel. Okay, so I have um, just two slides with results. So here I'm just showing a trace of um, the pre-concatenated, basically just 10X cDNA. And as I mentioned, like our average is around 1.5 KB. And then after concatenation and size selection, you can see the size greatly increases. And this is really what we want to make sure is loaded onto the SQL 2E, right? Uh, so here is a histogram of just the read distribution. So it looks as we would expect based on the tracer over here. Um, and then just for funsies, <laughs> we wanted to look at the top three genes. So if you remember anything about the panel I showed you, like these genes are definitely on it. These genes are definitely things we're interested in for epilepsy. So um, <clears throat> I think for us, it was just cool to see that, um, you know, the top genes getting the most reads are the ones actually on the panel. Uh, and for this particular sample, we've done maybe two or three of these now, but for this particular one, we, uh, at the end of the day, got 19.3 million unique molecules sequenced, right? So using an 8 million ZMW with concatenation, 
we're sequencing 19.3 unique molecules. So what does it look like when we overlay it with the gene expression data? So panels A and B, I'm just showing you the, so just panel A is the cells that we sequenced for this patient with the Reb mutation in their brain. Um, and then panel B is now showing the genotyping with the PAC bio data, which really increased our yield. Um, and you can see just these cell populations that I circled, these are oligodendrocytes and astrocytes. So they're not so much represented in the sample, but you can see actually that they're enriched in this bar plot, panel C, that they're enriched with this red color, which um, is the mutation that we were, you know, that we identified in this patient. And then the blue indicates cells um, that had the, just the wild type uh, allele. And then the gray still indicates the unknown. Um, so we still have like, you know, a good number of cells that are unknown, but this panel D here, I'm showing a comparison of the genotyping from short read versus the genotyping from MOS isoseq, and it greatly increased, right? So you can see this purple bar, um, not many cells have the mutation. We knew that from XM data, we didn't expect to see a lot. Maybe 10% of cells have this mutation in the brain. Uh, and then the green indicates cells that had the wild type allele or reference. And then the yellow indicates no call, right? So you can see going from short read to isoseq read when you compare it that there's um, the number of unknowns really decreases because we're genotyping more cells. So um, I wish I had more data to show because we're doing a lot of these, but we're very excited just with our initial iteration of MOS isoseq and the um, modifications that we've made. Um, and then I'll just leave you with one thing because um, so we we're happy with the results, right? But there's still a lot of unknown cells. Um, but actually, when we looked at Reb, so we're trying to genotype from RNA data, right, from RNA transcripts. So when we looked at the cells with an unknown call in this blue violin, you can see that um, a lot of them didn't express Reb. So if there's no transcripts, you're not going to read it. So at the end of the day, we're very happy with what we got. And, um, <clears throat> you know, still some caveats and um, difficulties, I guess, with the method that we're using, but um, very excited to do this on more samples. So um, I'd like to leave this slide up for questions. Um, and I specifically want to acknowledge Tracy Bedrosian, and my colleague who recently was awarded an R01 to further support this work that we're doing. So thank you. Thank you, Katie. Um, people, if you have questions, please use the um, Q&A chat. Um, I have some questions. Mm -hmm. So for the, I'm just going to call it the epilepsy panel. Yeah. What have you looked at the, I know it's, early data, but have you looked at the on target rate for that panel? So I don't I don't know the actual metric for the on target, but I can tell you like so I showed the top three genes, um, but yeah. actually there's 16 genes on our panel and they were all, you know, in the top 20 list. Um, but I don't actually know the on target. We've been working like with our bioinformatics team to because this is a different prep, right? We're just trying to like modify our bioinformatics pipelines to get it through. But yeah, I don't know that. Okay. And then I think your last slide kind of explained it because I was like, what are all the remaining untyped? Yeah. Yeah. And I think what you're saying is that, because I thought it was like, maybe you're not, you need to add more genes. Yeah. Um, like, do you think it's a matter of like, well, the RNA is just not, it's the transcript is not expressed? I, yeah. Or, I think it's, or, go ahead. Okay. Or, or do you think it's just like, oh, if I added 10 more genes, then I would be able to genotype. Well, I think so for this case, we're just trying to genotype that specific Reb mutation. And I think right. for this case that they're just not those cells that were, you know, uncalled or unknown just aren't expressing Reb. <laughs> mm, yeah, so true. I think, you know, there's just nothing there to read in terms of the right. Reb, right? Because what we did is like we generated a BAM file and then we just genotyped it for this specific Reb mutation. And so I think those cells just aren't expressing it. That's my guess, at least. Cool. Uh, maybe another general question, since you guys worked with bulk ISOSEQ and now MOS seek for a single cell, like where do you think for, you know, for your research, where do, where do you think you did, like, are the next most exciting things you guys want to try? Um, I think just getting more of these cases, right? I think I, for me, it's like um, just identifying the cell types that these mutations are in, because I, I, with epilepsy, at least, like, um, People often think the neurons are the causal cell type, right? That they're misfiring and causing seizures and stuff like this. So the data that we show indicates that these mutations are not enriched in neurons. They're other cell types. So for me, it's just generating more data um, from these tissues, right? So we have 24 of these tissues, and I've showed you two today. 
So it's just, um, I think, optimizing the MOS ISA-seq workflow in our hands and just generating more data. And you show with that publication that, that there's that P10 mutation for yeah. that pediatric case. Do you think it's always like, in, I'm just thinking like in that case, you already knew it's P10. Do you feel like if there's another, you know, epilepsy pediatric case, how would you, would you follow the same kind of method for like say whole episode sequencing to find the gene yeah. and then you target it? Is that what you have envisioned? Yes, that's definitely what we're doing. And the, the reason why we developed that panel with IDT to be comprehensive, uh, and we have another panel that's like way more comprehensive, but that 16 genes is just comprehensive of the patients where we've identified a mutation so far. Got it. So, yeah. Cool. Well, thank you. Yeah, thank you. I'll bring up Jason's talk. Cool. Well, I'll let you drive this. Great. Um, yeah, so I think this is a nice way to kind of um, wrap up. <laughs> it appears that we're sort of uh, taking from lots of different fields of single cell that were kind of come together uh, in this social club. It's really exciting for us to all to be able to talk together um, and share sort of some of these ideas. Um, and so I'm just going to talk to you about um, a little bit about the work that we've been doing um, on increasing throughput overall, which you've heard most of already today from other folks, um, and then a little bit about some of the hybrid capture methods that actually Katie also um, highlighted today. And specifically, I want to sort of make the case for why cancer is is really the, the another field that we should be all thinking about when it comes to um, long reads um, and ice forms. All uh, right, so. Uh, in general, single cell RNA seq these days. This is tabula sapiens from this year. Gigantic number of cells, gigantic number of reads, um, and it's just a, a whole new way of looking at um, at cell biology. Now, spatial's the same thing, right? There's these short reads that are being used to profile where things are in a cell. This this image from the cover of Cell I thought was really amazing. The um, Stereo seek from the BGI group. However, uh, the issue is that that's the gene era, um, and so this is uh, this is JZ and Beyonce on TRL in 2002. That's back when microarrays were used to study genes. We were thinking about genes then, and they were thinking about genes too. It appears, um, but now it's it's 2022, um, and it, it just doesn't make much sense that we're thinking about genes when we know that isoforms are really the currency that uh, people are using in order to, or that cells are using to make their proteins to, to change their biology. So um, we know that bulk isoseq has been used for years to unlock uh, mRNA isoforms and your favorite gene can be profiled that way, but it's hard when you get to do this through whatever single cell technology, because often there's just a piece of the gene is, is seen. So YFG, your favorite gene, you'd only see the three prime end in this case, or maybe a few junction reads internally. You'd never know that there's all this isoform biology there. And isoforms do matter. Uh, so what we've been working on, and, and you've heard a lot about uh, this already today, is tech development to increase throughput and, and help folks with isoform discovery. And so uh, it's the MOS ISOSEQ is, is an exciting development that the Broads offered, and, and uh, Katie just talked about they're using that in their own hands uh, there at Nationwide. And so it's exciting when you can take our hi fi reads that are accurate and just sequence a whole bunch of these at once. And so we're excited to bring MOS uh, seek to the whole community um, soon. Second is what if you just don't want to see some of these genes? And so you got to hear from John today about maybe we just use the telescope to point towards reads that we care about. Um, and so that's one way is just to sort of get rid of a lot of the reads that we don't care about. Um, and the last is a hybrid capture. That's another telescope that you can just point the reads towards that. And Katie talked about that for epilepsy and I'll speak about that a bit for cancer. Um, so I wanna also just point out that uh, many of the things you've heard about today is yes, you can look at cell type specific isoforms or disease specific isoforms. Uh, you can do things like predict open reading frames, go for proteins. But uh, a couple of the things that I think that um, are important to point out when those single cell short reads will really have a, a hard time 
is when reference-based alignment is needed. So there are genes in the genome that are very quite variable. Um, these are like things like TCR and BCR. And we've seen long reads make a difference with this really in the in the COVID era um, of people looking at what uh, antibodies are made uh, in response to the virus. But that's an entire field that's just waiting for uh, a ton more of this with uh, long reads, single cell, and, and especially with more throughput to be able to look at these things. Um, but finally, I, I just want to say that uh, with the long reads, you can identify things like fusions, mutations, or haplotype specific events that are just really hard to do with the short read alone. Um, and so I think that the, there's no better place to talk about that than um, cancer tr transcriptomics. So in you know, a, a cancer transcriptomics class 101, you would, your wish list would be being able to find fusions, being able to find uh, what I just broadly call alternatives. So I think we often think of alternative splicing, but remember there's alternative promoters uh, and alternative polyadenylation sites as well. There's copy number variants. Um, and there's also a uh, single nucleotide variants where, you know, one nucleotide can, can change an oncogene from um, a good guy to a bad guy. So only really the, the long reads are really the, the best way you can take a look at that. And we know that now from a lot of lessons we've gotten from the bulk. So um, this one uh, has already been mentioned, but this is just an incredible effort um, to look at breast cancer and look at the isoforms that are made uh, using long reads. I think the really striking thing was the number of novel isoforms that were found, especially many oncogenes that have a, a ton more um, isoforms than were thought to be from the gen code references. And that ton of these novel isoforms, you know, 30% of these affect some sort of conserved domain. And, and it also the same amount affect some kind of uh, protein localization signals. So we predict these, these are real, these, are, these do something. Um, and alternatives, uh, also promoter choice. This is a, a study I saw at Biology of Genomes, um, I guess about four years ago. Uh, and it was, it blew my mind that people uh, had, hadn't realized this, that they looked at 42 cancer types and, and normal tissues with GTEx. Uh, a total of over, you know, 18,000 samples with, with short read RNA-seq and found that, that it's really promoter choice is really one of the most important ways that um, cancer is regulated. Um, and this is a lesson that I think we knew from bulk isoseq is you really can't trust gene annotations. Uh, they didn't, they saw lots of promoters there that maybe weren't seen before. Um, and that just all, overall alternative promoters are very common in cancer. And that paper ended with a, a, a finding that certain promoters actually changed the patient outcome. So changed whether the, the survival rate of that cancer. Um, and so you fast forward a couple of years, and, and this was a, one of my favorites in ISISEQ uh, last year that I think has also been probably discussed today, is uh, basically the exact finding of that broad ATLAS paper was with gastric cancer, that there are is these novel isoforms of the ARD1A gene that when those new novel promoters are used, it changes the amino acid sequence of the protein. And it's really a, a, a gigantic change in the survival rate. Um, if that novel promoter is being used, the progression is, is much more grim um, for these patients. So when you have those reads, uh, that are only towards one end of the molecule and single cell though, this is gonna make this difficult. So these studies were in bulk. Um, and, and I really feel that one of the hopes for cancer and, and being able to look at tumor heterogeneity was, was single cell. Uh, but unfortunately by looking at genes only, there's still, um, I, I'd say we're kind of stuck in this um, T-SNE uh, UMAP era of this cell is different than that cell. Um, but when real reality, we want to look at the biology in those cells. What are the mutations? What are the fusions? What's all this? Um, and so that's something that we really, we really want to be able to to look at more. So to that end, uh, one of the other hard things that to do with single cell can be to look at single nucleotide variants that are in the middle of a transcript. And so this is some work that I've been uh, doing 
with Scott Furlan's lab. He's a pediatric oncologist at the Fred Hutch Cancer Center here in Seattle. And, and he had this interesting case of a pediatric uh, leukemia patient that had received a bone marrow transplant. So there's two different um, types of cells in, in this child's um, PBMCs in their, in their blood at that point. So we performed uh, an enrichment towards the cells of interest, the BLAS, and that's with a CD34 plus uh, antibody selection. Um, for this, we did both the five prime and three prime selection. Uh, it's similar to what Katie was mentioning. It's be nice to be able to not bias towards one into the other with mutations. Uh, and for this, we, we tried just an off the shelf cancer panel. So this is uh, 1,253 cancer genes. This is a panel that 10X Genomics offers. I think it's made by IDT. Uh, and that's, you know, that's kind of over the top with too many genes probably, but it's something where uh, we wanted to be able to be comprehensive. I think Katie's idea of epilepsy, a panel that's really towards the, the gene of, or the, the disease of interest is probably even better. And so on the right, you can see what happens when we either did the three prime uh, unenriched through you or five prime unenriched, you could see that only about nine or 10% of the reads were on target. So that means that they went towards these 1,253 cancer genes. However, when we perform the enrichment, so three UE or five UE, you can see that over 90% of the reads are on target. And so you could see that the lower part of these uh, violent plots of the depth. So you could see that Yes, we did get some of reads towards these genes without doing an en enrichment, but once we use the telescope to point towards uh, cancer genes, it changes that overall um, distribution. So what do we find in there? Um, so the cool thing is we were able to find the mutation, but even more exciting, I think, is that we were able to phase and separate the, the patient allele from the donor allele. So the patient, uh, the kid had an IDH1 R132 mutation. This was validated by another method. Um, and But we could see end-to-end -end reads of the gene IDH1. And uh, Liz wrote actually the isophase software years ago for dealing with separating haplotype specific reads in plants. But now the same technique can be used uh, in cancer to separate this allele from that allele. And so that, uh, that was an exciting finding. Uh, and then similarly, you can take those reads and go back and map those onto the, the clustering. So the overall Surat clustering uh, can be assigned and the cells can be colored by ex exactly which haplotype they came from. Uh, and as with Katie, we did see a couple of reads that seem to have both, um, which is, is, could be some sort of artifact that we, we don't know much about at this point. Um, so in general, the uh, isoforms are going to be important for biology. We know that. Um, and single cell is just a, a really prime way to look at it. Um, and so I'm excited to be able to offer, uh, we'll be able to offer MOS isoseq and, and be able to just increase the number of these reads so you can get um, more of the reads that you, you wanna have. Um, and I wanna just thank uh, the group I work with at, at Fred Hutch, Scott Furlan's lab, and the entire um, isoseq team internally. Um, and then also, um, the folks we worked with uh, at the Broad to sort of port over Moss Isoseq to, to learn more about it. Um, and with that, I'd love to take any questions. All right, Jason, um, I'm actually bringing some of our speakers back because um, this is the last session and we have uh, about 10 minutes. All right, um, well, I actually just wanna ask like, how do you guys feel about the session, uh, just the, the all the things that we heard so far today, is there anything that was surprising? You're like, oh, now I want to try that. So I'll go first is actually what I, you know, as the product manager for, for you know, ISOSeq, MOSSeq, what I have really appreciated now is the importance of doing uh, variant detection. Because <laughs> Katie, all your work is on variant detection. I was going to ask you and now is like, how are you doing it? Because are you using my code? Are you using somebody, some other tools? And then the other is um, the ability to do fusion finding now in single cell mm -hmm. data. Which obviously, I know pretty much impossible. Yeah, actually, I do want to comment on that because I so for the short read genotyping, we're using Vartrix, which I put on the slide. But I didn't mention for the MOS isoseq. Um, I was working with a couple people here, mostly Matt Cannon in our bioinformatics, and he's using Longbow, which I think 
is the package in that um, the Moss Isoseq preprint, if I remember correctly. But Lombo does deconcatenation. It doesn't do varying calling. Right. So he mind. would create the BAM file from Longbow and then just manually genotyped the variant that we're interested in. Oh, yeah. okay. So he's yeah, just so pulling out the reads. So we know the, you know, the very specific variant we're interested in. He's just pulling out the reads from that BAM file. And then we're overlaying it with the gene expression data using the 10x barcode. Okay. So yeah, that sounds like a manual process. That's definitely yes, I'm thinking very about. very much. It's <laughs> yeah, so as, as we think about the next version of um, of the software, like the previous session, you heard that Rogers explained how the current yeah. bioinformatics work, and I can already think about like how we would extend that. I know, I was wondering that, right? Because I think a lot of the focus is on isoform characterization, but for us, like our primary objective is, you know, we just want long reads that cover the barcode, the 10x barcode, and the variant we're interested in, and that's our primary objective right now, so. Yeah. Maybe this is I a bit of there's... my but we sort of have to reinvent a lot of what we think about single cell long read, right? Yeah. Because a lot of it has been these, like the, the main goal is to get that blurry uh, yep. map or something, yep. but um, it's exciting to hear that that's straight up on your mind. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <Good one. laughs> yeah. So I know this is very specific, but maybe something that I would ask our users like Antonio and Katie think about is what would it make more sense tools wise is to have each isoform also typed by alleles and that becomes a new isoform. Right. And that's something mm -hmm. to put into Syrah or mm -hmm. something where it's an isoform, but then we have an attached VCF file that kind of shows each mm -hmm. isoform because you, all of you have used probably like Syrah or Kana. Mm -hmm. Right. So right now with the MossSeq release, we're going to create two kinds of Syrah inputs. Right. One is gene level information. One is isoform level information. Now, I'm already thinking about if we start to add fusions and variants. Um, how do we represent them in these matrix formats that are still understood by, you know, uh, things like Sura? And looking at ScissorWiz, um, I wasn't aware that you could also visualize variants in it. So it seems very exciting. Something I want to try is how compatible is our output to ScissorWiz? Oh, so I, I talked about what, what was a good takeaway for me. <laughs> so maybe the rest of you. Um, yeah, I can, go, I can go next. I think in general, um, in, in our work, we've primarily been focused on bulk uh, ICSeq mm -hmm. as well, but um, I think I've, even though I have not given a talk in the last two uh, ICSeq social clubs I've attended, so it's been really great to see the progression of the single cell ICSeq and the MOS ICSeq technologies and what applications people are using them for. Um, and so it's just been really cool to see all of that. And it's given us a lot of ideas on things that we can do now with our technology that we're developing and with the capabilities of single cell ISOSEQ. John? Yeah, I think, <clears throat> I mean, I think um, we're, we're really interested to understand how our guide sets perform within the MOS ISOSEQ mm -hmm. system. And if some of the same advantages we see with the with the the current methodology um, also hold for that as well, because um, I think that the outputs that you guys are seeing there are really, really exciting yeah. and um, and uh, and really is putting that into a, a whole new realm. I think the I'm actually really excited to see it on Masi because I think the discovery power is very dramatic once we have that you know 10, 10 to fifteen fold increase. Katie. Um, yeah, I would. Um... I was curious about John's talk because we, so I showed you the top three genes that um, were represented in our data, right? But we were going after 16. And um, what I can tell you is like those 16 genes were not the top 16. So they were like, they were all within the top 20, but we repeatedly see mallet one in our 10X data. And I know it's a known thing. It's probably representative of like dying cells or something. So I'm almost wondering if we need to couple our hybridization capture approach with something like depletion of these other things just to like really maximize, right? Like the throughput. Yeah. I mean, it, <clears throat> we, we have, we, you know, as I said, I have background in targeted capture and, mm -hmm. and, and just um, uh, theoretically, we've always believed that removing, you know, spurious things in there and just yeah. driving the it's harder of hybrid capture will, always increase your on-target percentage. Right. Um, just recently, there was a paper that came out um, just in the, maybe not recently, February, I think, of 2022, mm -hmm. that showed just that, that it was increasing 
on target percentages. And so um, we just haven't had any collaborators to work with on that. So if you're interested, we would yeah. love to talk. <laughs> yeah, that's awesome. Antonio? I I don't have too, too much things to do because I started working with um, ISO SIG data from one month ago. Uh, but uh, in my PhD, I did uh, a lot of analysis about ISO forms in book Arena SIG. And in comparison with the single cell, uh, I think that there is a huge lack of information about the isoform, how the exon and introns are explosive, are indexing in the isoform. So, but I think that that information have a, a lot of functional applications in, in the data. So maybe with, uh, I don't explore too much tapas Versus or with, but maybe with that uh, packages we can get that information. But uh, yeah. yeah, so sorry because maybe it's my misinformation because <laughs> I don't work a lot with that. But these are all super new tools. The single cell, yeah, I need to do. <laughs> I need to do. Also, I'm not bioinformatician, so I'm getting used like uh, more. Uh, I need to get used to use more this kind of softwares. So to sum up, this uh, this uh, social cloud helped me a lot to, to learn about all the applications that we can apply to our data. Anyway, I will contact you for sure if <laughs> I have any issue, because I will have, I will have. Cool. Jason, I mean, you did the concluding talk. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I guess I, I'm... Uh... I'm a long-time advocate for this. I'm I'm not new to this. I'm the, I'm the opposite of Antonio. Um, but I just uh, I said I wanted to make the summary case, given that I think most people have uh, had heard by that point what is important about the long reads. But that I um, I'm extremely excited for this um, to come to mutation detection and that the whole world of especially uh, oncology. I think that there's just so much that people think uh, tumor heterogeneity is thrown around a lot, but this is this is literally a way you could look at it in a in a really high resolution way. Um, and I'm excited about things like uh, the jump code depletion to just kind of, you know, we know all those cells are going to have actin in them, right? So like, um, that's not what we need to look at. Um, and I think, do you, you know, target capture has its, it's, uh, you can only look at what you went looking for is the problem with that. Um, so I love the idea of just depleting um, and looking for the rest. That's um, that's super cool. <laughs> well, we have a question from the audience. <laughs> we have a minute. So um, maybe we'll just see if anyone wants to answer. I'm interested in sequencing genes that contain repeat expansions, such as CAG repeats in Huntington's in single cell or single nuclei. And um, the, oh yeah, the Huntington's transcript is 13 kilobases. So can MOSI be applied there? Jason, I'll let you take that one. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh. Yeah, I am. Um, I definitely have, uh, have fielded questions about both the repeat, repeat transcripts and about very long transcripts for, for a long time. I don't think that that would be the best case for the MOS because uh, it's not going to be uh, something that we can't do, you know, a whole bunch of concatenators of, of a 13 KB uh, piece. Uh, the HTT gene um, is something we've seen some people work on. I think it will be hard to get it end to end. Um, uh, yeah, I, I wish I had a better answer. Unfortunately, reverse transcriptase is not the greatest enzyme to go through things. Uh, and, and PCR tends to break. Um, above maybe five or six KB often too. So it's it's very much a challenge um, to go after these repeat expansions. Um, and I, I admire and um, I, I continue to talk with people about this kind of stuff a lot because I, I think it's a really important area. Yeah, in bulk isoseq data, I know we've looked at some Huntington isoforms that, but the limitation there is, I think we don't, we, we start at the three prime end and we are 
So we, we don't see a full NCD in it that goes to the five prime end. And I think it's less of a sequencing issue because we can totally see long isoforms um, bulk without concatenation. Mm -hmm. it, it's more of a, we couldn't, we, the RT doesn't produce the full length. That's the right. And, and uh, often we've, you know, we've had good success with sort of counting the lengths of repeats with uh, DNA sequencing. Um, I think often because, you know, you don't have to copy it the same way when your you know, DNA is rod like, um, that, but it's sort of like deciding, coming up with a way to enrich for those reads specifically is, is harder. Um, but it's, um, it's, it's an area we're definitely thinking a lot about. I'll say that. I did have a question for Jason, if there's time. Sure. Yeah. Okay. So, I mean, it seems like a lot of the talks today focused on single cell RNA, but I'm wondering like what your thoughts are with single cell DNA and what um, maybe you've done with that. Um, so I can just say for us, we used to use a kit from 10X Genomics that they now discontinued. Uh, and then we learned at AGBT some companies that are doing like DNA and RNA sequencing, but most of them were plate-based, right? So you're not going to get nearly as many cells as you would with, say, a 10X Genomics platform. So That's right. Um, so the single cell, the single cell DNA sequencing right now, um, we, we, I mean, most of the techniques that do this kind of stuff are very low coverage, very low, you know, they don't get a ton of reads and they aren't very big. Um, of course, we could get pretty good sized reads, I think, out of single cell DNA. Uh, and there is actually a nice preprint out using um, transposases to make smart bells um, that I could point you towards. But uh, the problem really comes with the numbers game of like, so if you wanted to do uh, a thousand cells um, and then you had, mm -hmm. you know, you know, you have a six gigabase genome, uh, <laughs> yeah. those cells, uh, and then you say dice it into 10 KB pieces, um, your sampling uh, is going to be going to be really low. Yeah. Um, so that's a that's a challenge for for this point. Um, I think that it's a it's something to think about. But overall, single cell DNA sequencing, I still think is is a tough, a tough yeah. cell to me in general. Yeah. I, but I'm an RNA guy, like, right? I've been doing <laughs> RNA for 25 Same. years. DNA is just that stupid upstream part. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Who needs it? <laughs> RNA is the first phenotype of the cell. So why wouldn't you want to measure a phenotype, right? Fair. All right. Thank you all so much. Um, I hope to see you all soon. Bye. Bye.